So is there anything uh, still outstanding from last time? Is there anything that needs uh, needs more attention? Anything that needs uh, further clarification from uh, last time when we were working on uh, setting the tone for how we're going to go ahead and read the book of Leviticus together? Okay, very good. Well, uh, we said last week, I'm going to turn on some more lights here, actually. There we go. So we said last week that um, most of the book of Leviticus is, comes to us from the priestly source. And that reads a lot more like a user manual or, uh, or instruction book than it does a story. However, uh, so one of the challenges is that a lot of the tools we use for Bible study relate to how do we read a story and look for meaning and so on. Um, those tools don't work really well uh, for most of Leviticus. That said, throughout the book, there are a few narratives, uh, and we are going to look at those tonight. They are brief, uh, and they are, um, some of them are, are very difficult to make sense of. So we're going to, we're going to thrash around with those together tonight. Um, so again, the, the setting for these stories is that we have, we, we've had the Exodus and the people have made it to the foot of Mount Sinai. And we are in the first month of the second year of the Exodus. People have been gone from Egypt for a year and they are camped out around the mountain while God reveals uh, his teaching to Moses. Um, most of what we have in Leviticus, of course, is the content of that teaching, but we do get some of these here. So the place of worship, the tabernacle has just been completed. Uh, that's at the very end of Exodus, and now we get into Leviticus, and the first narrative we run into uh, is in chapter 8. Uh, by the way, was everybody able to access the handout okay? Very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good, 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 good. So let us turn to Leviticus chapter eight, and we're going to read the whole chapter. So we'll break it up into uh, break it up into a couple of uh, sections here. Um, let's see. Nick, can I have you read verses one through nine? Uh, Robin. Verses 10 through 17, Andrew 18 through 29, and Carol 30 through 36. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, the vestments, the anointing oil, the bull of sin offering, the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread and assembled the whole congregation at the entrance of the tent meeting. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. When the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent meeting, congregation, this is what the Lord has commanded to be done. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons for washed him with water. He put the tunic on them, fastened the sash around him, uh, clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him. He then put the decorated band of the ephod around him, tying the ephod to him with it. He placed the breast piece on him and in the breast piece he put the urim um, and he set the turban on his head and on the turban in front he set the golden ornament the holy crown as the Lord commanded Moses. So, Moses Robin, before you, you get oh, rolling here, I realized what I wanted to say before we got started and I forgot is take a moment and look at the questions uh, there. So as we read, we kind of know at least some of the things we want to lift up and, and look at, but take a moment to pause and, uh, and look at the questions. So uh, Robin, if you want to give people just a moment and then go ahead and, and carry on. I'm sorry, I forgot to... Uh, uh, throw that out there to begin with. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. Why don't we go ahead and press forward here. <laughs> then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and the consecrated and consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times and the and anointed the altar and all its utensils and the basin and its stand to cast consecrate them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with cloth coats and tied sashes around their waist and bound caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses. Then he brought the bull of the sin offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull of the sin offering and he killed it. And Moses took the blood and with his finger put on the horns of the altar around it and purified the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar and consecrated it to make atonement for it. And he took all the fat that was on the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with their fat and Moses burned them on the altar and the bull and its skin and its flesh and its dung he burned up with fire outside the camp as the Lord commanded Moses. He then presented the ram for the burnt offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. Then Moses slaughtered the ram and sprinkled the blood against the altar on all sides. He cut the ram into pieces and burned the head, the pieces and the fat. He washed the inner parts and the legs with water and burned the whole ram on the altar as a burnt offering, a pleasing aroma, an offering made to the Lord by fire, as the Lord commanded Moses. He then presented the other ram, the ram for the ordination. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. Moses slaughtered the ram and took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and the thumb of his right hand and the big toe of his right foot. Moses also brought Aaron's sons forward and put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet. Then he sprinkled blood against the altar on all sides. He took the fat the fat tail, and the fat around the inner parts, the covering of the liver, both kidneys and their fat and the right thigh. Then from the basket of bread made without yeast, which was before the Lord, he took a cake of bread and made with oil and the wafer. He put these on the fat portions on the right thigh. He put all these in the hands of Aaron and his sons and waved them before the Lord as a wave offering. Then Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar on top of the burnt offering, an ordination offering, a pleasing aroma, an offering made to the Lord by fire. He also took the bread, Moses' share of the ordination ram, and waved it before the Lord as a wave offering, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took some of the anointed oil, anointing oil and some of the blood that was on the altar and sprinkled them on Aaron and his vestments and also on his sons and their vestments. Thus he consecrated Aaron and his vestments and also his sons and their vestments. And Moses said to Aaron and his sons, boil the flesh at the entrance of the tent of the meeting and eat it there with bread that is in the basket of ordination offerings as I was commanded, Aaron and his son shall eat it, and what remains of the flesh and the bread you shall burn with fire. You shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of the, pe of the meeting for seven days until the days when your period of ordination is completed, for it will take seven days to ordain you. As has been done today, the Lord has commanded to be done to make atonement for you. You shall remain at the entrance of the tent of the meeting day and night for seven days, keeping the Lord's charge so that you do not die. For so I am commanded. 
Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord commanded through Moses. So let me ask first, has reading this chapter maybe helped people see why I have decided that maybe starting at chapter one, verse one, and reading the whole book straight through is not the approach we want to take? Would, would we want to read the whole, the whole book of this? It's really no, because it, <laughs> it'd probably all be the same thing. <laughs> or, or it might strike us as the same thing. It's not. It's not. And we'll, we'll see some of that here. So um, why do Moses, Aaron, and the people engage in this really elaborate rite? We've got animals being slaughtered and butchered and blood and oil going every which way. Why, why do they do this? What, what is the... Um, yeah, why, why do they do this? And this this is not a trick question. I'm God, guessing the Lord, because of the Lord commanded it. Yeah, God God says so. Uh, where do we see that? Many places. Verse one. Right, many places. Um, verse 5, um, as Moses introduces them to this whole rite of ordination, this is what the Lord has commanded to be done. So that, I think, reminds us of what we talked about last week the notion that many of the things in here are probably not what any of us would have designed or decided would be the rituals we would use in worship but whose whose place is it to make that call if you are going to approach god if you are going to approach the holy who gets to make the call about how that is done faithfully So in, the Jewish, in the Jewish faith, when the rabbi is ordained, do they do this? No, because remember that the priests, the priests primarily have a sacrificial role, and the priests are descendants of uh, Aaron, or they are Levites. So the the priest is a very different role than a rabbi. The rabbis, if we remember, are the descendants of the Pharisees. So in the New Testament, you have the Sadducees, and they are the people who are more tied to the temple. So we talk about the priests and the high priests. Those are the guys who are in Jerusalem. The Sadducees hang out with them. After the temple is destroyed, they're, they're done for. But the Pharisees are the ones who are saying, you know, the 350-odd days a year were not at the temple how do we live faithfully? So suddenly when there's no temple, their school of thought becomes the only game in town because these scenes have all committed mass suicide. Um, so this, what we are seeing here, this ordination so that they are properly prepared to lead temple worship is, is not, it is preparing them for a different ministry than what rabbis do. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, at, at, the, at the heart of it, yeah, well, why do they do this? God says so. And we remember that as people of faith, that ideally is, is all the answer we need. Um, but again, we, we have to remember as we read this, there's going to be some stuff where we're just going, that this does not... Compute with us, probably. But again, God is offering instructions of how we can faithfully and safely approach what is holy. There is that tradition. Nobody stands face to face with God and lives to talk about it. Um, you know, Moses saw God in a cloud and Moses was glowing when he came down off the mountain. That's, that's not normal. So God is saying, I will tell you very specifically how you can approach me. So all of this has to do with remembering that Aaron and the priests, they're, they're going to be kind of up close and personal with God in this tabernacle. And they need to be properly prepared to do this. So, um, you know, God says so. And why does God say so? Because people need to approach what is holy in the way the Holy One specifies. 
Um, I made a note to myself as I read this, and I looked this up. We have the Urim and the Thummim. Um, those are some sort of device for casting lots. Um, they could have been knuckle bones from an animal. They could have been carved from stone. They could have been wood. Uh, we're not totally sure, but the priest used them to uh, answer yes or no questions. So sometimes the priest would not necessarily need to consider something and make a ruling, but the priest would say, God will make these land in the way that is right. And they cast the lots and it would answer the question. Um, I asked earlier this morning, we had a council member uh, sitting with us in, uh, in Bible study. And I said, what are your thoughts on reviving this practice at council meetings? And I was told that maybe, maybe we, we don't want to go that route. So, um, so uh, I just wanted to make a note of that because it just says there are these things and then it doesn't say anything further about it. So I wanted to make a note of that. We have three separate offerings that take place and each one here is a little different. What is the significance of the first offering? Sin offering. Sin offering, yes. So before the people can lead worship, they need to be ritually cleansed of sin. And they do this uh, through this uh, sin offering. Uh, what kind of animal are we sacrificing here? A bull. bull. We are sacrificing a bull, yes. Um, oh, I also wanted to point something out here. Uh, verses 10 through 13, we have the oil that we are anointing with. Um, oil is very often tied to preparation for God's work. Uh, when we are anointing people, um, we are preparing them for special special work, or we are anointing them to heal them. Uh, among people who would be anointed would be priests and kings. The Hebrew word for anointed. Does anybody remember this from, from other studies? So the Hebrew word for Anointed, a person who's been anointed is Meshiach, which when they translated it into Greek, they wrote out as Messiah. Um, the Greek word for anointed, anybody remember what the Greek word for anointed is? No. Christos. No. Which when we translate into English becomes... Christ. Christ. So, so, but the oil also means that they're the chosen one, kind of, right? Yeah, the oil is a sign of kind of being sealed for, for God's purposes. So the idea of Messiah as the chosen one, the person that God is going to send to put everything back in order, that develops later. There are many people in the Old Testament who have that title applied to them because they are or anointed for a specific task. Um, so, for, for instance, one of the more famous examples is King Cyrus is called Messiah. God has anointed him to defeat the Babylonians and let God's people go back to Israel. Um, you know, he's, he's not even Jewish, and he's a Messiah. Um, so again, this idea of Messiah, Christ, anointed to do God's work, uh, it has really deep roots. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we want to make sure we read our Old Testament carefully and understand it. Um, it's good to read it and understand it on its own terms. Um, we are reading it as, as Christians. So it is also a value to say, uh, what does it, how does this help us understand Christ and his ministry better? So we have our first offering. We have atoned for sin. How is this the, the second offering? How is it different than the first offering? It was a ram for burnt offering. 
Okay, so it's a different kind of animal. And what kind of offering did you say it was? Burnt. It's a burnt offering as compared to the first one, which was a? Sin. Sin offering. So we have a sin offering and a burnt offering. How exactly does that differ in terms of how we go about doing this? If we're reading the instruction manual, let's make sure we understand it. Well, it, it seems like they cut up the ram into many parts versus the bull, which didn't seem to do that. They just seemed to take its blood and purify the altar with it, which I don't quite understand how that purifies an altar, but. Well, the burnt offering is to be consumed all the nations. I'm sorry, say that again, please. The blood offering is for washing sin. And the burnt offering is for consumption for ordination purposes. Right. So we, we have we have two different purposes here. And we're going to spend some time with kind of the purpose of burnt offerings. They don't specify it here. They just say that it's different. But with the sin offering, we kind of take the the inedible parts and the entrails and burn them on the altar. And then the rest of the animal is taken away and burned elsewhere. So we have part of the animal is just burned to create the, the pleasing aroma for God. And the rest of it is taken out. Um, it doesn't specifically say that they went and ate the rest of the bull. Uh, they may have, they may not have, but it, I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that the rest of the animal got eaten because you don't want to waste. I mean, a, a cow is a big animal. You, you don't want to waste the rest of it. So anytime we see that idea, and, and every time we see that idea of a burnt offering, it means a whole animal offering, when typically the offering is a lot of times just the parts that people probably wouldn't eat. Um, so clearly, clearly sausage making was not a thing in uh, among the Exodus people, because if you come from a line of people who make sausage, you know, we eat everything but the oink. So, um, so yeah, we, we have a different, we have a different technique for different kinds of, of offerings. We either slaughter it in pieces and use the blood and we take some here and some there, but it's also interesting. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this detail and I don't know what to make of it, but they are going to burn this entire ram as a burnt offering, but they are instructed to stop and wash some of the pieces in water first, which I just find a, a fascinating detail. And I, I don't know what the significance of that is, but the fact that they're washing it before they burn it, I just find interesting. Does the cleaning have a bearing on how it will smell? But certain items smell a lot better burnt when they do not have certain odors on them. That's certainly a possibility. Um, yeah, it could have something to do with we want to make sure that the offering is actually uh, clean when we offer it up to God. So, you know, if they're washing off the hind quarters and entrails, yeah, maybe they're washing some of the, the dung out of it. Or if the thing was in the mud, we want to offer a clean offering. And yeah, there, there could be a little bit of that stockyards effect. There was a reason why people like incense. Um, yeah, it does yeah. say it's an offering for a pleasing odor. So. So we have our sin offering. We have our burnt offering, which at this point in the book, they do not offer a ton of commentary on the, what the burnt offering does, but we're going to explore that uh, in coming weeks. We have a third offering. Um, what is the significance of the third offering? What does it do? A wave offering. Right, a wave offering, but what does the... It's a ram of ordination. Right. The, the, it is the, 
the technique, I guess I would say, is, is a wave offering or an elevated offering that they lift it up uh, before God, before it's placed on the altar. But the purpose of it is uh, for ordination. Um, so we see there in verse 22, we have the ram of ordination. In verse, uh, uh, verse 28, this was an ordination offering for a pleasing odor. Um, and then we have this fascinating... Uh, this fascinating right in the middle of the description there. What do people make of uh, verse 23? Moses took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, the thumb of his right hand, and the big toe of his right foot. And I jotted yeah, that down in my notes. Like I said, this is the first time I've ever taught Leviticus, so as these things occur to me, I'm making sure to jot them down. Right here. I don't get the significance of why those parts. It says in the blessing is from head to toe. We're going from head to toe, right? I like that. In my footnote, it says in the ancient Near East, in, in con incantations recited during the ritual meeting a person, statue of God, and building testify its purity, its purpose is purificatory and apotropiac, to wipe off and ward off the incursion of menacing forces. Always it is the vulnerable parts of the body, extremities, and structures, corners, and entrances that are smeared with magical substances. Okay, so yeah, maybe, yeah, I, I think, I certainly think part of it is we're consecrating the whole person uh, from head to toe. Your ears where you hear God's word, your hands that you do God's work with, your feet that walk a faithful path maybe. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating that we talk about how the blood purifies. Um, the blood purifies the altar. The blood uh, is put on Aaron and, uh, you know, presumably purifies or consecrates him. Now, Pastor, Pastor my, my book did reference Exodus 29, 20, which is basically what it just says. But underneath here, it says, the, and it is an act of purification and consecration. The right ear emphasizes hearing and obeying the word of God. The right thumb signifies that the priests were now pure to handle the holy things of God. And the right toe allowed the priests to walk on holy ground, pure before God. Aha, okay. So we were, we were not far from agreement, at least, with the, at least with Robin's study Bible. So that's good. <laughs> I, I'm also kind of drawn to that idea of typically we do not think of blood as purifying. And in a lot of instances, it is considered uh, unpure or unclean for ritual purposes. You, you know, to butcher an animal in a kosher fashion, you drain the blood um, and so forth. But I suspect in this context, we, we read in Leviticus later that the, the life, life is in the blood. So I think it may have something to do that people understood blood is a, a life-giving substance. So it may have something to do with in order to atone for sin, in order to uh, prepare us to be in God's presence, we need to return some of the life God has created to God. So it may have, like I said, off the top of my head, my thought is that it's um, the fact that the blood is intimately tied to life. So that may be what's going on there. But that just kind of jumped out at me. And why, why would we do that? Um, interestingly enough, we have one offering where they take parts of it and they say carry it outside the camp and burn it. We have another offering where we say we're going to incinerate the entire animal on the altar. What do we do with the ram of ordination? Eat it. 
Right. Yeah, we're going to eat it. And um, why are they going to need to eat that ram? Why do they need a whole animal for the three of them or the five of them? Because they're going to be in uh, sequester for, for a period of time. Right, yeah, you, you will not leave the tent or else you're going to die. So this ram is supposed to feed them for a week. So um, that's also, I think, just kind of interesting. Each of the offerings is dispatched with or disposed of in a different way. So like I said, Leviticus is kind of short on, on narrative What's the significance of this narrative? How does it move the action forward in an important way? Why do we tell this story when there's so few stories in the book? Is it kind of preparing uh, for a a priesthood, if you will, for when they get to the promised land. Right. We've we've built the tabernacle. We've put its put its furnishings in it, so we have the place prepared, and now we need to have the people prepared to lead worship in it. So I think it it uh, transitions us into now is the time when we can approach God in the way God has revealed to us. So this actually moves us into all this stuff that God has told us about. The first seven chapters are all about different types of sacrifices. Only the priests can make those sacrifices and those offerings. So now we actually have the people prepared. So we are ready to actually approach the holy. We are ready to encounter the holy uh, in a faithful way. So yeah, absolutely. We, we now have the place prepared and we now have the people who are set to uh, enter that place in a, a holy fashion. Um, questions, comments, concerns on the, the rites of ordination? I will tell you my ordination was nothing like this. <laughs> Thankfully. Even though my ordination was a long time ago, it was not like this. So. <laughs> What, what was the obsession with the uh, with the uh, fat in the of the of the animals, and especially in the third one, um, they kept talking about the fat of this and the fat of that, and and then they were going to give it to them to be eaten. It was almost. I mean, do they consider that the primo of the? the meat I think kind of like a piece of fat on a good piece of steak <laughs> it probably is the best flavor yeah I mean that's what I'm wondering it does have you know <laughs> even though the obviously this was before the time of cardiologists but this uh, <laughs> but it does have a, a sweet flavor mm -hmm. so so if we, if we look at this third one, uh, starting in verse 25, the broad tail, all the fat around the entrails, part of the liver, the kidneys, and the right thigh, they took that and the bread, and then Moses took them from their hands and turned them into smoke on the altar. So I, my suspicion is that some of these entrails and parts were maybe the less appetizing stuff. Um, also, as, as we know, uh, those of us who, who cook at home, fat burns. So it may yeah. have had something to do with the fact that, remember, God, God doesn't need us to offer God sustenance. God, God is perfectly okay without that. This is for our benefit. So it may have said something to do with the fact that these parts maybe burn better uh, they'll create that smoke that is going to drift to, to God and be pleasing to God. Um, and it may be that the, these are the least desirable parts to eat. Um, I don't know, some of you are going, I love liver, but not, not everyone does. Um, okay, so they didn't, they didn't eat it, they, they burned it. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. 
Okay. So, um, so there. All right. Are we are we ready to wade into wade into choppier waters yet? I have a, a question. Yes. Um, so Moses commands that the people come to the to the uh, well the temple or the tent and yes. they wait outside and he calls Aaron and his sons forward. Would this be a one and done kind of? They're anointed after all of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then it's Aaron and his sons that are only able to come to inside the tabernacle. Right. Okay. I'm clear. Thank you. Okay. Okay, very good. So much the better. All right. Like I said, let's let's dive in a little deeper here. Uh, mm -hmm. We... I will say we spent a lot of time with this next story this morning. People were really struggling to make sense of it. So let's see. Let's see if we can come up with the answers tonight. Um, uh, George, would you read, please, um, chapter 10, verses 1 through 7? And Rhonda, would you please follow up with chap, uh, verses 8 through 15? Okay. Now Aaron's son, Nadab, and Abihu each took his censer, put fire in it, and laid incense on it. And they offered unholy fire before the Lord, such as he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, Through those who are near me, I will show myself holy, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron was silent. Moses summoned Mishael and El Zaphan son of Uzel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, come forward and carry your kinsmen away from the front of the sanctuary to a place outside the camp. They came forward and carried them by their tunics out of the camp as Moses had ordered. And Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, do not Dishevel your hair and do not tear your vestments or, your, or you will die and wrath will strike all the congregation. But your kindred, the whole house of Israel, may, <clears throat> may mourn the burning that the Lord has sent. You shall, not, you shall not go outside the entrance of the tent or meeting or you will die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is on you. And they did as Moses had ordered. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Drink no wine or strong drink. You or your sons with you. When you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, and between the unclean and the clean. And you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. Moses spoke to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithamar, his surviving sons. Take the grain offering that is left of the Lord's food offerings and eat it unleavened beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat it in a holy place because it is your due and your son's due from the Lord's food offerings, for so I am commanded. But the breast that is waved and the thigh that is contributed, you shall eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you, for they are given as your due and your sons do from the sacrifices of the peace offerings of the people of Israel. The thigh that is contributed and the breast that is waved 
they shall bring with the food offerings of the fat pieces to wave for a wave offering before the Lord. And it is yours and your sons with you as a due forever, as the Lord has commanded. All right. So in the chapter, uh, so we started with chapter eight on the ordination. Uh, in chapter nine, we actually see Aaron go about beginning to tend to these priestly duties. So everything is off to a great start. Fantastic. We are worshiping God faithfully. We are approaching the sacred in a faithful way that God has revealed to us. And then we get this story. So what is the problem with Nadab and Abihu's offering here? Well, I guess it wasn't pleasing to the Lord because they died. Right? And what is our what what are we to understand is not pleasing about it? It was it was an unholy fire, right? It, it wasn't commanded by God, right? To be done. It was mm -hmm. it was not as God commanded them. So they decided we're going to go ahead and, and freelance this. We're gonna we're gonna go with our gut on this. Um. So remember, who's, who has the actual authority to determine how we approach God? God. God. Right, right. So uh, these two sons of Aaron um, decided that they were going to offer this in a way that God had not commanded. Um, so this is, this is problematic. Um, Leviticus again. We approach the holy in the way the holy one tells us to, not, you know, kind of whatever strikes our fancy. Um, there is, to my knowledge, no real consensus about what makes fire unholy. Um, you know, what, how in particular this, this happened. But the idea is just that there was some kind of teaching or commandment about the proper way to do this, the faithful way to do this, and they did not abide by that teaching. They did not abide by that teaching. They entered into that place, the presence of the Lord, and the fire of the Lord consumed them. Remember we said last week, we approach being in contact with God as potentially dangerous. Uh, it's like other instances we are more familiar with. Um, when we are entering somewhere that is potentially dangerous, uh, there are proper ways to do that. Um, I am not going to walk into the, the COVID unit at the hospital dressed like this. You know, I am encountering something potentially dangerous. There's a proper and safe way to do that. These guys did not take the proper and safe way. Um, what do you make of God's commentary? Moses, Moses comes in and says, well, this is what God said. Through those who are near me, I will show myself holy. I will be glorified. I before all the people will be glorified. What do you make of, of that commentary on two people who have just been ordained being Them, themselves, they, they are ordained so that they can uh, offer burnt offerings of animals. They themselves are burnt. What do we make of that that commentary? let's take one step back before we we try and make sense of this god says i will show myself holy when we use that term holy in scripture what does it mean of god okay so it means of god uh, it means something 
Something more specific, even. How about most high? Most high? Heavenly. Yes, Heavenly. We're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. So if, if God is, is up high, and we'll, we'll think about it like that, if God is most high and people are not, what, what is the difference? Are, are God and people like this, or are they like this? Yeah. They're like that. He's above us. Above us by a little bit or by a lot? A lot. A lot. So there is a, there is a separation. There is a, a it, it is not just for God generally or of God generally. It is something that has been specifically separated or set apart for God. So when something is holy, it's set apart. It's set aside for the specific purpose that God is going to do something with it. So the priests, they are holy. They go through this whole ordination ritual because they as people are set aside. They are set apart from the usual uh, responsibilities that people have to one another so that they can serve God in this way. And we're going to see that in just a moment. So if God says, I will show myself holy, I will show that I am separate, I am set apart from, from people, does that offer any insight as to what has gone on in this kind of horrifying story? Let me throw out another story here for comparison that I think that I think can be helpful. We are all familiar with the Tower of Babel, correct? We can get together and say, you know what a great, you know what would be a great idea? Let's build a tower to connect heaven and earth, and we will be the most famous people ever. Everybody think this is a great idea? And they all said, yeah, let's build. What, what gets God angry enough that he destroys the tower and makes it so the people can't talk to each other anymore? What is it about that that, that makes God go, no, this is not happening? They tried to elevate themselves to his height, and um, that's not, they, they tried to, jump across the uh, the separate the yes yes yeah. gold star for robin <laughs> genesis chapter one what is god doing that whole first chapter god separated god separated the dark from the light god separated the heaven from the earth so now when the people say yeah we know god separated this we know god's trying to bring order out of chaos but I think it would be a lot cooler if we crossed that line, if we crossed that boundary, if we tried to close that separation. I think the same principle is at work here. God has said, I am holy. I am distinct. I am separate. Like I've said before, I told the confirmation students Monday night, if you have learned nothing else from, from what we studied in the Old Testament, remember, God is God and you're not. It's God's role to say this is how it works. So when I, th I think what is going on here, God says, I will show myself holy. I will show that I'm separate. I think God is showing that God is serious about that boundary between himself and who he has created. Is it also a factor about state of mind? Because we talked about Aaron's two sons. How did they do it? They did it in an un unauthorized way. Tower of Babel, there was no way they were going to reach heaven by building that tower out of stone. But they mm -hmm. had a state of mind that they still nonetheless wanted to be, meet, meet heaven. So I think it was yep. state of mind with, with Aaron's children, or son, and a state of mind when the people tried to build the Tower of Babel. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, God is aware of our motivations, probably more so than we are ourselves. Um, so yeah, their state of mind, their motivation. Um, I, I don't know that Leviticus would offer us a clear answer on this, but 
in, you know, how, how much grace does God have for, so if, if these guys are offering an unfaithful offering, they're not only approaching it, they're not only doing the wrong thing, but they are approaching it in the wrong way. That's probably not going to open them up to seeing a lot of grace. Do we think maybe God would show more grace if these guys came in good faith and wanted to honor God and something, something went wrong along the way? Didn't Moses ask Aaron about how he conducted uh, some of the, 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 ta the tabernacle procedure? And when he explained it to Moses, Moses was satisfied? Yes, I think, I think we do see that. And I think it's also interesting to point out that we have, and and we may touch on this a little uh, next week, there are different types of offerings. There are different types of sin offerings. There is the offering for uh, things that you, you did that were a sin against God that you weren't aware of. And there are things, there's an offering and a process you have to go through when you knew it was wrong and you went ahead and did it anyway. So maybe, 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 uh, like you said, Andrew, maybe state of mind has something to do with it as well. Um, but yeah, we remember Leviticus is trying to show us how we faithfully approach the holy. Um, so when we don't approach the holy faithfully, this, this gives us a, a very clear illustration of, you know, we're, I almost hesitate to say it. You're playing with fire. <laughs> Thank you. Someone laughed. Uh, <laughs> so um, I mentioned a moment ago about people, the, the priests are holy. They are set apart. They are separated out from typical things that people might do so that they can uh, achieve God's purposes here. What are Aaron and his remaining sons exempted from, or maybe not exempted, but told expressly, you will not do this? No mourning. No drinking. Yeah. So they, they are they're not only not allowed to actually tend to the dead to go and take his son, their brothers, and bury them, said, you, you are not leaving the tabernacle. You leave the tabernacle, you die. I don't think God gets too much more clear than that. They're not allowed to tend to the dead. They're not allowed to mourn the dead, uh, dishevel their hair, tear their vestments. Um, th those uh, very widespread customs of mourning in their culture, they couldn't even do that. Uh, Aaron's cousins are are put in charge of that. So even so, I, I think that idea of being holy, of being set apart for God, it is more important even than the most basic obligations to family. And I think that's pretty profound. So we have, we have the offense, the beginning of the chapter. We have God dealing with it. We have God instructing Aaron and his sons how they are not to deal with it. What does God do after that? Looking uh, you know, down around verse 8 and following. What does God do after this offense and God's response to it? Um, teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. Right. So God goes back to the priests, Aaron and his remaining sons, and he, he helps them understand their purpose more clearly. No wine or strong drink when you enter the tent of meeting. Um, Distinguish between the holy and the common. It, it, it is your responsibility to make that call and uh, between clean and unclean. 
teach the people of Israel all the statutes. So God has given them further instruction and clarified what they are to do as priests. Um, and then going forward, uh, God indicates that the priesthood is going to be supported by a portion of the offerings. And God said, this will be uh, in place forever as the Lord has commanded. Um, so it's, let me stop here. What's, what's your gut reaction or your first response to this story? Fear. Fear. Okay. Yes. I'm not messing with God. <laughs> but to be fair to him, he's made it very clear what we need to do. Okay. Yes, God God is trying to, yeah, make it very clear. And, and God is equally clear that, yeah, God, God does take this seriously. That had to be incredibly tough. I mean... Aaron watched two of his sons die because they did something they shouldn't have did, and he still carried on and did what he was told to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when you stop and think about how these things actually affect people, it, it really changes the, the tone of the story. It, these weren't just like two made-up fictional people who you know, we're in a fable or something like it. These were his children. And could yet, also, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, it could have also been a, a, a remedial approach that God was following uh, in that Aaron, if you recall, during the time when God gave the Ten Commandments was the one that actually made the golden calf. It might have been a, mm -hmm. a remedial way of dealing with Aaron and his sons too. They took a little bit stronger stance because there was some remedial Reparations and his behavior that he needs to address. Yeah, we, we've already we already seen Aaron's track record is not not stellar at this point. Um, that I don't I don't think that is the case. First of all, because Torah also teaches that. Um, Children will not be punished for the sins of their parents. But I, I think there is, there is a larger pattern going on that I, I think may speak to that a little bit. Uh, and oddly enough, we're going to touch on the golden calf. So why don't we go ahead and jump to that? Um, why don't we go ahead and uh, move down there? Some parallels that help us understand the story. Um, Let's see, Rhonda, will you share with us, please, Genesis uh, 2, 15 through 3, 7? And Tom, if you can share with us Genesis 3, 17 through 21. Uh, let's hear that, and we'll go ahead and, and break that down a little bit. All right. So 215 through 37. One moment. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, eat of it, you shall die. Then God, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its flesh, place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, 
This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eye, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. And Tom, can you pick up a little bit farther down in chapter three there? <clears throat> and he said to the man, you listened to your wife and ate the fruit which I told you not to eat. Because of what you have done, the ground will be under a curse. You will have to work hard all your life to make it produce enough food for you. It will produce weeds and thorns, and you will have to eat wild plants. You will have to work hard and sweat to make the soil produce anything until you go back to the soil from which you were formed. You are made from soil and you will become soil again. Adam named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all human beings. And the Lord God made clothes out of animal skins for Adam and his wife and he clothed them. So we have here, we start with God's goodness. God creates the garden, God makes the man, puts him in the garden and says, you're here to take care of the garden. Everything you could possibly want is here for you. Um, there is one tree, one, that you cannot eat from. We have God's goodness in all this providing. We have God's instruction. You need to do this in order to have a good life. Don't eat from this one tree. God even ups the ante, and God says, okay, I've given you all this great stuff. You know what? I'm going to make you a partner, because it seems like you're lonely with everything that's in there. I'm going to make you a partner. God is so good. Then the people decide, well, we know God gave us this instruction, but we think we know better. We're going to go ahead and help ourselves to, to the fruit of this tree. We have the people's disregard for God's instruction. We have the consequences. There's a consequence for the serpent. There is the consequence for the woman. There's the consequence for the man. And then verses 20 and 21 are sometimes, sometimes we miss. God keeps the man and the woman together. God still allows her to become the mother of, of all living people, and God clothes them. So at the end, we have God showing mercy and trying to help set the stage for something, something good to come even from this. So we have God's goodness and instruction, human disregard for it, a consequence, and then we have God's, you know, God's kind of mercy and renewal. And by the way, I uh, had a clergy person tell me about uh, the pastor somewhere in Nebraska or somewhere like that. And uh, they had congregation members telling him that uh, anesthesia should not be allowed for childbirth. It's God's will. Let's look at Genesis. It says, you will, uh, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. And I guess the pastor said, what about the air conditioning that you have in your, your tractor? Is that against God's will? 
And of course, the farmers out where he was pastor said, are you crazy? No, we, we would never do that. What, what are you smoking that you think we should be out there without air conditioning? He said, well, by the sweat of, the fa of your face, you will eat bread. And when you got that running, you're not, you're not sweating in there, are you? And that was considered going too far, but um, <laughs> saying that there was no, no anesthesia for childbirth, that was okay. Well, I was also thinking, is this the first uh, indicator of a woman is never satisfied so that, you know, <laughs> we make our husbands eat the fruit and, and now they have to toil forever. Well, on, on, a, more, on a more serious note, yes, yes, a woman is never satisfied. I, I'll quote you on that. Kim said, but on a more serious note, and then, then we got to move on to Exodus, God is doling out consequences for people's disobedience. And God says, as a consequence, your husband will rule over you. <laughs> let, me, okay. let me throw this out there. So for people who are saying, yes, it is God's will that men are in charge and women are not. Let's is, move on to Exodus. Is, is that a faithful <laughs> statement? Well, I guess if it's in the Bible, right? Well, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. <laughs> but that that hierarchy, that, that patriarchy of the man is the, the Lord over the woman. Well, God puts that in place as a consequence. That was not God's original original plan. God says, I'm making you a partner. I am making you an equal. And because people screwed it up, God says, you know what? It was good while it lasted, but it's not gonna, not gonna stay like that. So if somebody wants to come out and say, yes, dudes should always be in charge of everything all the time. Cause you know, that's the way God wants it. I, I'm not a hundred percent behind that argument. Well, I think that was all done on April 1st. So it was an April fool's day. Um, just had a thought that went completely, completely out the side. Let's turn to Exodus. Uh, Exodus 31. I think we're, we're back to the, top of the order here, which has been scrambled because people are jumping up and down on my, my screen here. Uh, Kim, will you share with us, please, uh, Exodus 31. Let me see how far I want you to go here. Uh, Exodus, yeah, 31, 12 through 18. And then, uh, Robin, will you share with us 32, uh, 1 through 6? The Sabbath law. Okay. The Lord said to Moses, you yourself are to speak to the Israelites. You shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, given in order that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does not work on it shall, whoever does any work on it shall be cut off from among the people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of, soul, of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the Israelites shall keep the Sabbath observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant it is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. When God finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant tablets of stone written with the finger of God. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together for Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods 
who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to, him, to them, take off your rings of gold that are in the ears of your wife, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off their rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made pro proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be the feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. All right. Uh, Nick, will you share with us, please, chapter 32, verses 25 through 29? When Moses saw, chapter 25, you say? 32. Uh, yeah, chapter, chapter 32, 32, verse 25, yes. Okay. When Moses saw that people were running wild, or Aaron had let them run wild to the derision of their enemy, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, put your sword on your side. Each of you go back and forth from the gate um, to gate throughout the camp, and each of you will kill your brother, your friend, and your neighbor. The sons of Levi did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 people fell on that day. And Moses said, today you have ordained yourself for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of a son or a brother, and to have brought a blessing on yourselves this day. On the next day, Moses said to the people, you have sinned sure. against. We'll, we'll stop there, but could you jump down okay. to chapter 34 and share with us just verse 10? He said, I hereby make a covenant before all your people. I will perform marvels such as have not been performed in all of earth and in any nation. And all the people among whom you live shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. So... We see the same pattern here. We have God's goodness and instruction. We have God's goodness. We've brought you out of Egypt. I'm giving you the Sabbath as a sign of this covenant. You will actually have a day of rest, something you did not have when you lived as slaves. So we have God's instruction. You are going to worship me in this way. We have people's disregard for the instruction. They say, well, yeah, God's told us a lot about worshiping and no other gods and that sort of stuff. But uh, I think it'd be really slick if we had a golden calf. Let's go ahead and make a golden calf. Let's worship another God. We have God tells Moses, you better get down the mountain and do something about this. We have a consequence. The sons of Levi go through the camp and they start to kill the people who are worshiping the golden calf. Then, at the very end, the covenant is renewed. God, God has mercy, and God renews. God sets the stage for something positive going forward. I think this pattern also helps us understand that story we just read of Nadab and Abihu. We have God's instruction. We have God's goodness. And remember, some of the instructions seem a little difficult for us to wrap our, our minds around. But remember, the instructions are for how we can be in communion with God. The instructions are for when we do something that does not honor God. God actually gives us a way to say, 
We can make this right again. This is all good stuff. God, God is showing us the right way to do things, that there is God's goodness and instruction. Nadab and Abihu choose to disregard that instruction, and they face a consequence. God lets the priesthood continue, though. God says, I'm going to make sure that the priests have a clearer understanding of who they are and what they are to do, of the way they are called to be holy. God doesn't just say, you know what, this first generation of priests screwed up, I'm done with them. God says, I have corrected them, I have showed them a consequence, now I'm going to help them do better. You know, God did not say after Adam and Eve in the garden, you know, this whole humanity thing, I'm done with it. No, God said the consequence and God then tried to help them do better. Um, the Israelites in the desert uh, with the golden calf. I told these people one God. They didn't listen. God didn't just say, forget it. God renewed. God says, I'm renewing the covenant. Um, and I think that is what's happening here. I think God is saying, I am renewing how we are going to worship. I'm going to help the priests understand it better. And I'm going to allow the people to continue to worship me faithfully. So I think we see this pattern repeated throughout, certainly Torah, the first five books of God's goodness, people choosing not to hear what God is saying, God sending a consequence, but not ending the relationship, but not letting that be the last word. And I think we see that pattern at work here. Um, it is by all means a difficult story. It, it uh, certainly stretches us ethically. Um, but again, we got to remember to read it on its own terms. Um, we, we cannot set aside our, our own experience. We cannot set aside our own uh, lens of reading it. But we do have to also try and look at it as for the people telling this story, the whole point is God is telling us what is faithful and it's not our place to decide. Um, let me stop there. Questions, comments, concerns, insights? I, I think one, par one parallel though that's kind of di uh, difficult to accept uh, with these three parallel readings here. I mean, there were consequences for Adam and Eve, obviously, and, and there were consequences for Aaron in Exodus, but they got to survive their consequences, whereas Nadab and Abihu were, were zapped. So mm -hmm. that, that part there is, you know, it's just a, it, that, that's a little more difficult a little more difficult to grasp and accept, I guess. Right. You know, so it, they could have just burned his fingers, for example, right? Like, oh, that hurt. Um, right. So if we look at that golden calf incident, we, we had about 3,000 people who didn't survive that. Um, so I think maybe there's a little more. So part of the people did, did perish as a result of that. And here, part of the priesthood did perish as a part of that. So maybe, maybe that's the parallel uh, there. And again, like you said, Aaron, who the people turned to and said, do something, he said, I got a great idea. You know, he certainly got a talking to from his brother, but it was nothing on the order of uh, you know, being cut down with the sword. But I, I think maybe the parallel is that, um, or, or may, maybe the, the most important part of the parallel is that, yes, part of the people of Israel, yes, part of the priesthood died, but God allowed the rest to continue. And maybe, 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 that's, uh, maybe that's an important part of the, the parallel to be, be clear on, if that helps. Yeah.
Other thoughts? Have we gotten into anything that is, is sufficiently outside our realm of experience yet? Was this the first time vestments were mentioned in, in the uh, in the Bible when they were in the, in the first story we read about the vestments of the priests going through the ordination ordination the first I ordination? Think, I think there are some. I think in Exodus there are some commandments regarding uh, vestments. Um, yeah, Exodus 28, vestments for the priesthood. Uh, so that gives much more detailed specifications as to how these things are to be made. Um, but I think this is the first place where it says, now that you've made these things, this is how we prepare them to actually be put to use. Okay, but it is interesting. We still use vestments today, and obviously quite different, but mm -hmm. in a sense, there is a direct linkage going all the way back to this time. Yes. You don't come in Bermuda shorts, um, you know. And... <laughs> Although my my brother keeps telling me I should be wearing jeans because cool pastors wear jeans. Yeah, so. well, I, yeah, and that's another point. I guess that it, vestments are becoming a thing of the past in some respects. That's a conversation yeah. for another night. Or a robe and sandals. <laughs> so, well, friends, we've we've come to the the end of our time tonight, and I I once again appreciate your willingness to uh, walk with us through through Leviticus. Like I said, we're on kind of strange ground, so uh, we're all we're all learning together. But uh, let's close our time together tonight, uh, praying the Lord's prayer together. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be hallowed thy be name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone, and we will see everyone soon. Have a good All right, have a good night. Thanks, good night. Pastor. Thank you. Good night, Very everybody. Well. Good night.